The only Danish I can speak is for helvede, for helvede Frankie, du skylder med 30,000 i det om 10 minutter. It's from a movie called Pusher. <laughs> Um, when I was a young boy, I, I used to travel to Copenhagen to a place called Christiania. Uh, I started to go there when I was about 14 years old. And I bought a lot of hash and I smuggled it to Sweden and sold it in Stockholm. So that's my relationship to Denmark. <laughs> uh, 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 some of my friends been here also, uh, quite spectacular uh, visits and um, did some robberies, took like 80 million Danish crowns. Uh, it was uh, 10 years ago or something like that. Uh, I'm sorry for that on their behalf. They did a lot of prison time, so they served their sentence. Um, so why am why am I talking about this in a Christian conference? Yeah, because I didn't grow up in church. I, I I didn't grow up in church. I was the first church I ever visited. What I can remember, it was when my cousin killed herself when I was 14, and um, and it was the funeral. That was the first time I I remember I I was in church. And I was looking at my cousin in the casket, and uh, her mother was uh, beside me, and uh, our grandmother on the other side, and I was squeezing my hands. And uh, looking at, uh, I was just looking at the casket, crying, and uh, and uh, so, it, you know, that's not a great invitation to church. I did, I didn't want to go to church after that, uh, not even on funerals, but of course I had to. Uh, when I grew up, I was bullied in school. I grew up in a dysfunctional uh, surrounding and uh, got bullied in school. And uh, yeah, I began to go another way. You know, if school is not safe for you, you go to the neighborhood. And uh, in the neighborhood, there was a lot of crime. Crime rate was high. Um, and actually, after that first funeral, I, I started with drugs. I think I was 13. I, I, I started with drugs when I was 13. And, um, and it went on from that, a life of crime, a life of violence. I remember, I, I think I got beaten up like every week, my entire upbringing. So I, I, I was filled with hate when I was a young man. And uh, I found myself in, the, in a situation where I uh, almost killed a man. Uh, I was in a lot of violence. And uh, I got my first prison sentence. Um, that didn't really scare me because it was like, uh, you, you know, it's, it's a hard situation in Sweden. It's worse now, but it was very hard back then also. Uh, I was in prison for, for the first sentence was three years. And uh, when I got into prison, it was a hard environment. And uh, my, heart has, my heart has become very hard by, by that time. Uh, and I was so filled with hate. And the only thing I could think about was that I wanted to climb in the world of crime. Now, why did I want to climb in the world of crime? Yeah, because if, if it's not very hard mathematics to know that if if a guy gets bullied in school, being being walking around with a feeling that I'm so little and I'm so weak. Of course, you want to prove that feeling wrong. So you want to become feared, you want to become powerful, you want to become strong. So when I went into prison, it, it was not like this is the last time in prison. It was quite the opposite. It was like a university of uh, crime. So I met a lot of heavy criminals in, in there and they saw the potential in me because I was turned off emotionally and I was filled with hate and I was ready to do whatever, whatever was needed to be done, you know? Um, so in, in that first uh, prison sentence, I, I my friend, uh, he died in, in jail because uh, he had uh, a seizure. He, he became very sick. He was thro thro throwing up blood on the floor. And we were screaming at the prison guards, please, please, please 
call an ambulance or we didn't say please we we kicked the door you know and <laughs> so call the ambulance or otherwise you know like that and they pressed the alarm and all the guards came running and they just locked us up and we saw him die and uh, when he stopped breathing the the guards uh, called uh, the ambulance so you know that kind of things fills you with even more hate uh, I also got a girlfriend at his first prison sentence that was like a, a, a good little relief in a gangster environment to to have some love and some comfort of course it was not uh, it was very dysfunctional love because I was so broken and she was also broken she just came out of Jews youth prison also so it was quite hard she um, and um, she started to do heroin and I said if you can't do her heroin because it's it doesn't ma match my lifestyle you can do cocaine I said you know but not heroin and um, but because it was like frowned upon in with with my crew to do heroin um, and uh, she said, Sebastian, if you, if you leave me, I'm going to kill myself. And uh, I was so angry with her because she promised me to not do heroin. So I said, do whatever you want, see if I care. And that night she killed herself, you know. So, um, so that's, that's another baggage to carry in life. I, I, all, when I was still in prison, I started to do robberies. When I, you, you can get out to, to work, uh, but I paid off the boss at the, at the place where I was supposed to work. To, so you, I say, you can have this money just every time prison calls, say, tell, tell them I, I'm here. And uh, we started to do robberies, and I started to gangster rap. I met the guy. It was a big heist in Sweden, a big robbery called the Arlanda robbery. It was an airport. And um, and they got away with 44 millions, and uh, then then they started to kill each other and got lifetime prison. You know, they were very famous criminals, and 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 I got in their crew, and we started to do a gangster rap, the first gangster rap group in in Sweden named Cartel. And, uh, you can just imagine how dark everything was, and there was nothing about God, there was nothing about church, nothing about any of that. You know. And uh, this group became a big problem in Sweden. There was a lot of riots in Sweden, and they used to put big speakers in uh, in the riots, playing my music, and just throwing stones at the police and burning police cars and stuff like that. So the Swedish government held two Christ meetings, what they're going to do with the problem, you know, Sebastian and his friends. Uh, so uh, so we, and, and we deliberately... Um, created a war with the Swedish police, with the government, with, with the, I got the Swedish police, uh, how, how do you say it, SAPO, secret, uh, the, uh, the, 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 yeah, the secret police. That was not so uh, very s secret, you could see them for like 400 meters, <laughs> you know. They had like, uh, like four uh, re review mirrors, you know, and like eight antennas on the car, so like, how, uh, you're not very secret. But, but still, it was a lot of heat, you know. But all the time, I, I was driven by the hate, you know, that I got when I was a kid, when I was, well, and, and, and the biggest hate was, of course, the hate that I had for myself. I didn't like myself, and I was trying to prove that I was not, because if they say, you are not, no good, they, they used to say that to me in school, you are, you are no good, and, and if I can't be gr good, then I'm going to be the b baddest you ever seen. That was like, um, and this is common for many children, you know. If I can't be good at being good, I'm going to be good at being bad, you know. It's, it, it's, it's a classic. But people, uh, people started to die all around me. I can say that today I lost 37 friends. Uh, that's a lot. That's like uh, over three football teams, you know. So uh, I lo lost uh, a lot of people and uh, seen a lot of death and been near death a lot. I don't, I don't like to to bring this up because it's like I want to, I want to talk about Jesus because it was Jesus who saved me. But 
I want to give you some background of what I'm going about what I'm going to tell you, you know. But when I got out of prison uh, that, the second time, I got caught for for a robbery. We we put some explosives on an ATM bag with uh, one million in cash, and boom, and burned the money in three months. And then the task force from the police kicked in the door while I was sleeping. And they said, good morning. No, they didn't. They said, <laughs> lie still, we're going to shoot you. It was like that, you know. Uh, but, but I met a new girl, and, and she, got to, she got pregnant. And I was about to be a father. And the first time I met my child was in, in, in custody, you know. I was, I was in prison. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm about to meet my kid for the first time. And exactly when I'm going to pick her up, the guard said, no touching. It, it, the baby can be used to smuggle drugs. No touching. You can only see, you know. So what kind of thing to say to a new father, you know, first time he meets his child. So that experience was completely ruined. But when I was in that prison sentence as a father, I, I started to, to seek for a way out. I wanted to go out from the life of crime. But when I got out from, from prison, one guy, he, we called him Choka, you know, he, he, was, he had been um, wanted by the DEA for 400 kilos of cocaine. He was been in, internationally for, over Interpol and DEA. They chased him, you know, all around the world. And um, he beat that case and he came back to Sweden. He's been an international player for, for quite some time. And he, he got back to Sweden. And... Um, and my friends who are doing lifetime sentence from the rap group, they said, uh, you, you be with, uh, with him now. He's going to take care of you. So, but, you know, be with him, it's, it was like climbing up like five steps on the crime ladder. You know, it's, it, it, it got way intense and it was way worse. So I had a plan that when I go out, I'm going to be uh, a good father. But five, uh, six hours after I've been released from prison, I already had a gun on me. And uh, it, it, it just started again. So he, he had a lot of wars, so it was a lot of, of, of heavy situation where people once tried to kill us and, and you know, vice versa. It, it was an intense period. And uh, one day, uh, it, it became so bad in, in, and, and so dangerous that I had to do cocaine every day to, to, to cope, to manage, so of course, and I had one more kid by that time. So now I have two, two children, but I, have, I, I didn't know how to be a father, and I was out all the time, and everything was being so dangerous around me. And, uh, and I got a phone call from him. He said, I'm, I'm about to, to go to South America, no, to Finland. Uh, I'm about to go to Finland to, to visit the guys in prison. So he come and meet me there. So I, I take a plane from Stockholm and I go to, to, to Helsinki. And when I go out from the, the airport, there's a guy from Finnish Bandidos. He, he, he comes to me and he says, uh, Interpol just took your friend. Uh, so he's in prison. Now, he had uh, the, the Interpol and, uh, and, and the authorities in South America, they did a coup on him, they, so they had a plan, you know. So they took him, and without uh, extradition uh, or anything, they put him in, on a plane and, and, and sent him to South America to, to do some heavy, serious prison time. So that means I lost my, my big brother, I lost my protection, and uh, it was a very serious situation for me because uh, the, the power we had was in him, you know? So when we come back to, to Stockholm, everything just gone to shit very, very fast, you know? And uh, I was uh, kidnapped, I almost killed, you know? I, I've been uh, the worst situation ever. Okay, so when I go out from the hospital, I, I come home to my apartment, and outside the door, there's a big garbage bag with all my clothes. And I said, you are not welcome in this home anymore, and you are not allowed to see your children. And I'm standing there all bruised up, and you know, so if, there's a, if there was a low in my life, that was it, you know. So with this garbage bag, it was like a movie, you know, it's, 
I, I was like, okay, now I don't have a reason to live. Why am I gonna live? I hate my life, I hate living. So I go up to, I, I, I go to my home, I take my gun, and I was gonna shoot myself in the head. Then my friends come and they, and, and they say, we need a gun, it's a situation in an area. And, and, and so they take the gun, and I was like, from every day, I, I lost the gun today, you know. So, so I was like, okay, I, I jump in front of the train instead. It's, it's because when my cousin died, her two best friends jumped in front of the train and killed herself on that same platform. So I knew that that worked, you know, because both of them died. So I, I got there, I, I stood on the platform like this, and, and I was waiting for the train, and it was not no drama queen stuff, you know, it was like, okay, I'm ending it. So, so when I'm standing there, uh, I get a phone call like this, and uh, two minutes before the train comes, or two or one minute, it's my big brother who calls me. And he and I haven't spoken in like six months. He didn't want anything to do with me because you know, everybody was so angry with me because of the life I was living. So I was like, why is he calling me? So I pick up the phone and I say, hello? And he said, don't do anything stupid. Me and my father is uh, paid for a rehab center for you. You're gonna get help today. So go home and pack your bag. Everything's gonna be all right. And I hang up the phone and, and the train. <laughs> And you know what happened in that exact moment? You know, I looked up to heaven and I said, God, this has to be you. I didn't grow up in church. I have nothing, you know, in, to do with church, but I knew that God had saved me. It was, it was no pastor or preacher or evangelist, nobody on the platform, but I knew that God has, had saved me. It was too orchestrated, you know, because it's like, so, so I went home, I fixed my bag, went to the rehab center, you know, and when I go into the rehab center, I, I, they, they tell me, you're not an evil person, you have a disease of addiction, you know, and, and I was like, disease is, well, I'm doing coke, is that a disease? You know, but, but it is, you know, it's, it's, it's when, when you are a slave under drugs and alcohol and you, and you don't want to do it but still do it, it's probably you have a disease of addiction, you know, and I had that due to a lot of trauma in my life. So I, I but I felt instantly that I have to go into the room, close the door behind me, go down on my knees, put my hands like this, and pray to God that he saves me. You know, and, he, and I said to him, I, I think I saw this in a movie, that's why, you know, I, <laughs> but, but I, this is what I, what I said, God, if you save me from my enemies, and if you give my children back, and if you make me a sober, you know, I, I promise you, I will serve you for the rest of my life. This was 2011. I forgot that prayer five minutes later. <laughs> God did not. So, so what happened, okay? I, at, at, at the same time, I, 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 I blew up with, I, I had a, like a hit song, it's called Mina Omroden. Uh, Eric likes it. <laughs> um, he, he, he's, a pa he's a gangster pastor, Eric. He listens to gangster rap, yeah. But uh, he loves it. Um, but it was a big hit. It, I think it's got like 50 million streams on Spotify or something, and that's a, a lot in Sweden. So, so, so I get a career, you know. So I, I stopped being like, a, uh, I didn't stop being a criminal. I stopped doing robberies and, and you know. No, I didn't stop doing that either. Uh, <laughs> I have to be honest, I'm in church, uh, but, but I scaled it down, okay, we can say this. I scaled down, yeah, heavily, yeah. So, uh, so I, but I started to go to meetings, AA, you know, and you know, and God is in the program, you know, so you, it was like, okay, God, he was, I, there was a guy in, in I said that, um, I don't believe in God. I, 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 uh, my higher power is my goldfish. <laughs> and I was like, okay, how, how long does a goldfish live? I asked him, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but, yeah, speaking of Buddha, yeah. Uh, 
But what happened was uh, I, I, I got famous, you know, and uh, forgiven in media or almost, you know, and, uh, and, and stuff like that, but still empty, still hated myself. But at the same time, my, my, uh, my gangster boss then, you know, you remember in, in South America, he, he uh, her, his sister, Flavia, she got saved in, in Stockholm. A born again Christian, filled with the Holy Spirit. So uh, the pastor asked, "Is there anyone you want us to pray for?" She was like, "Yeah, you can pray for my brother, but God can't save him because it's he, he, like, no God can save everybody." Yeah, I, I understand that, but not him, you know. <laughs> so, but the whole church, this Spanish little church, started to pray for for Choka. So uh, one one day she got a prophetic uh, message, that, and, and she said to him. When, when, when he called, he said, today uh, uh, somebody is going to uh, tell you to hear the gospel you, and you're going to go there and hear it. And I was like, oh, she's crazy. And I just hang up. Uh, then he's training in the gym. Then the warden in the, in the prison comes uh, and, and said, yo, you're, there's a pastor coming here today and you're going to hear him. You know? And he was like, whoa, this was, okay, I, I go. He hears the gospel and gets saved radically saved you know and he he started to 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 pray and get changed and i go to south america to see him in 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 the prison i, I go there and i see him and i see he's radically changed i have my friend with me and he's there to 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 do uh, other st stuff you know so so when he said okay i can't help you with that because i'm saved he was like no jesus no you know but i was happy because i saw in his eyes that something good had happened so i all the flight back I was thinking about that he saved he saved then another guy from that same church was at a, uh, at, at a retreat in in Chile you know and uh, and he was doing business uh, straight business no no funny stuff in in Chile and uh, and and went to a retreat and there was a prophet on that retreat you know that said you know somebody in prison and he said, no, I don't. But one week earlier, he had had a Skype call with, the, with, with Choka, you know, in, in the prison. Yeah, you talked to somebody in prison, he said. Uh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, I did. Okay, this is what the Lord says. Go to that uh, prison and tell him that you are the sign you're going to get free from prison. Okay. And he said, no way, you know, it's like, I'm going to go to a gangster boss and say, I am a sign you're going to get free from prison. What happened if that prophet was full of shit, you know? It's, <laughs> I'm going to end up in a barrel in the jungle, you know? It's like, but what he didn't know was that the same, you know, that same time, my friend in, in, in the prison, he, 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 he really started to follow Jesus, but he had prayed that, Lord, I need a sign. Am I going to be here forever? Am I going to be here forever? I need a sign. I need a sign. So he, he goes, um, and he, then th this was his honest prayer to, to God, you know, I need a sign. What happens? Uh, this, uh, this guy, uh, he, 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 he goes to his hotel room in Chile for, for three nights. He has a dream. He sees a, a man with an orange shirt, uh, shirt orange shirt, uh, picking up at the airport, you know. So he understands he has to go. So he buys uh, a plane trick ticket from, from Chile to Uruguay. This is a very long trip, you know. So he, he goes there and he lands. Uh, and when he lands, there's a, he, Choka's little brother, Frankie, he, he comes with an orange shirt to pick him up. So we understand, okay, this is God, you know. So he goes to the prison and he says, I am your son, you're going to get released. And they both start crying, you know, in this, in, in this meeting. I, this is an amazing story. I'm not going to go to the details, but what happened was he was released, you know. And this was very heavy because the charges against him was so, so heavy. So I was, uh, I, I, I said I scaled down, but I just got caught with a loaded firearm in Stockholm City. So I was, had an ankle monitor, you know, I had an ankle monitor, so I was in my home and I was thinking about life and I was, you know, and one day, it's, I, I have a knock on the door and I open the door and my friend, Choka, standing outside of my door in Stockholm with a Bible in his hand 
and he says, now I'm going to tell you what Jesus done in my life, you know. And he comes into my house, and we started a cell group, very, very, <laughs> and, I was out, and he was like, we're going to start a cell group in your house, man. And I was like, yeah, I got an ankle monitor cell group, just came from prison. It sounds like lining up with my life, you know. But, but then I heard the gospel, and I received Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior. And uh, a few years later, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and, and I could stand here for, for days talking about the miracles I've seen and, and the love I felt and, and the grace that's been given to me through the, our Lord Jesus Christ. But I love him, and I can honestly and proudly say before you today that I am holding up to my promise that I gave God 2011 in November in that rehab center. If you save me, I'm going to serve him for the rest of my life. Well, he saved me, so now I'm serving him for the rest of my life. Lord is good. Thank you.